Welcome to God is Open. Today on God is Open, we're going to be talking about SJWs always lie. Oops, I mean Calvinists. Calvinists always lie. The subtitle is, in fact, uh, how Calvinists are the SJWs of the theological world. SJW is a term, a term used for social justice warrior. In American politics, it refers to this vile subset in American politics who, who champion quote-unquote progressive causes, ex extremely regressive individuals, people who want to destroy wealth, destroy prosperity, to create racial tensions, and to drive up uh, physical assaults in the U.S., and they, they're racist. They're incredible racists, these SJWs. And so this is who Calvinists more and more remind me of. I've, I have uh, a lot of experience debating Calvinists, hundreds upon hundreds of Calvinists I've debated throughout the years. I know how these guys think. I know how they operate. Yeah, I understand that, uh, quote unquote, not all Calvinists lie. Not all of them do. The vocal ones pretty much always lie. They're always uh, big liars. Will Duffy was just in a debate with this Charlie Ray guy. Just just the scum of the earth, this Charlie Ray guy. And uh, he kept saying that Will was lying about him. But, uh, of course, Will lying about him is just Will saying, this is the conclusions of your belief. Or this is what you said with this belief. That's Will lying about him. And so instead of addressing Will's points, he bans him from this Calvinist site. Oh, the Calvinists take on all all objections. You know, they answer all the questions. No, Calvinists don't. They run from fights. They're cowardly people when you, you're able to stick it to them. We've had a lot of Calvinists over the years join on our God is Open Facebook group, but one of our rules, one of our key rules is that if you're asked a direct question, you need to answer it. You have to answer questions. And this drives Calvinists nuts. And they, they resign in protest. One guy, he says, I'm not going to play by these rules. I'm out of here. I'm not going to be forced into your questions. You can't answer questions. You can't answer questions. You're fundamentally dishonest. And I see these patterns over and over and over when I'm dealing with Calvinists. For those of you who don't know what social justice warriors are, they're, they're this, these individuals who uh, they, they discard facts, reasons, evidence, and they try to get on this uh, new age leftist type of uh, thinking. They're not, they're not the old style liberals who believe in free speech. These are violent individuals who will shut down free speech through violent means. They'll say, oh, punch a Nazi. And who's a Nazi? Anyone who doesn't agree with them is considered a Nazi and they'll punch it. That's funny thing is they themselves are the fascists. These people are incredibly racist individuals. Uh, they hate white people. They hate any black person who's going to stand up and uh, call them out on their antics. They'll call them Uncle Tom's. That incredibly racist thing to do. They'll call like Clarence Thomas and Thomas Sowell, Uncle Tom's. These are incredibly vile people that we're dealing with here. And so I'm going to show you a little montage of these social justice warriors just so you get to get a hint of who we're dealing with, what kind of fanaticism is in these SJW ranks. And then you have to start looking at their mindset. How do they think? How do they think the world operates? And does the world operate by the principles that they, they have conjured in their own head or not? I am the feminist who is ruining your perfectly respectful marriage by suggesting Audre Lorde to the book club that your wife attends. And yes, I am the one who convinced her to get that shorter haircut that you pretend to like, but don't really like. No, explain to me how Trump is like Hitler. <laughs> Master portion. God works all things after the counsel of his will. Even keeping those kings who want to commit adultery from committing so. And when he wants to, he orders those to commit adultery when he wants to. Fantastic. What lovely people, right? We might have thrown in uh, Dr. Zacharias, Dr. Dr. Zoidberg clip in that little montage, but look at it. He's the same type of person as these SJWs. They, he just spits rhetoric, and I say spits rhetoric because he doesn't think about rationally what he's saying. He just says whatever he thinks sounds good, and it resonates with his audience. Look at how the pen and pulpit treated his speech. They, they treated it with glowing praise because these people are fanatics. They have discounted 
all semblance of reason, and they've just lashed, latched onto this rhetorical flourishes. And you watch, you watch these Calvinist preachers, these John Pipers, the R.C. Sprouls of the world, and they just spit rhetoric after rhetoric after rhetoric, these little platitudes like, oh, God's sovereignty, God controls everything. And, and Calvinists take those little clips and they put it into their little memes and they post it on pages. And uh, it's like, well, normal people don't disagree with those quotes. They just disagree, disagree with what that quote means, what, what that little phrase, God is in control. Okay, yeah, President Trump is in control of this country. Uh, no, he doesn't micromanage everything. In fact, he doesn't know very much of what's going on in this country. He's just in control of it. Right. But Calvinists will take the same phrase that uh, is used elsewhere with a, lo a lot different meaning. In normal speech, it's used with a lot different meaning. They'll apply it to God and they'll say, if you reject this, uh, you're rejecting that God has any semblance of power. And God is incompetent if you re reject our meaning of this. And their meaning, of course, is God micromanages everything. So if there's a child getting raped, they believe that God is micromanaging that rape. And that's their vile, vile belief that they force onto this phrase and they're word thinkers. And remember, Scott Adams says word th thinking is one of the lowest forms of thinking where you, you hijack phrases in order to uh, appeal to emotions. And in fact, if you Google worst argument in the world, it is the non-central fallacy in which you take, take a word or phrase and then you use a technically correct definition, but not the common definition. It's the worst argument in the world. So social justice warriors, they'll do this. They'll say, oh, everyone's a racist who doesn't agree with me. A Nazi is another thing. They'll, everyone, who, everyone who disagrees with me is a Nazi. And of course, in their world, they can attack Nazis because SJWs are vile, vile people. But uh, Calvinists will do this too. Everyone that disagrees with them is a heretic, right? And so instead of arguing the finer details of what you're claiming, they'll say, oh, that's heretical. Or they'll say, oh, that was condemned by whatever council. Okay, what makes that council authoritative? It's like these people in these councils believed all sorts of crazy things you reject, but you just want whatever you disagree with to be a heresy. So you'll just quote, whatever, you'll just call it a heresy, even if there's no counsel, like uh, open theism, they'll say, oh, it's heretical. What counsel made it heretical? But Calvinists are like SJWs, they word think. They want to say, oh, you guys are the bad guys, we're the good guys. Everyone who disagrees with me is a heretic. Everyone who disagrees with me is not saved. And you'll see this over and over. Anyone who's not a Calvinist is not a Christian. You'll you'll hear it coming from all sorts of their, their common folks. There's people like R.C. Sproul who kind of disown this a little bit. R.C. Sproul says they're barely People who are Calvinists are barely Christians. And he has this uh, clip where he says basically that uh, if you raise your hand and you believe God doesn't control everything, then you're basically an atheist. I said, okay, how many of you don't believe that statement? And 30 or so hands went in the air. And I said, fine. Now let me ask another question. I said, without fear of recriminations, uh, nobody's going to jump all over you. We just would like to know. Feel free to state your position. How many of you would call yourselves atheists? And nobody put their hand up. And uh, I went into my Lieutenant Columbo routine. There's just one thing here I can't understand. <laughs> so I said, and, I, and I looked at those 30 who had raised their hand, and I said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? I said, I can't figure out why those of you who raised your hand saying you did not believe this statement, didn't raise your hand when I asked if you were atheists. You're an atheist if you don't agree with them because these people are not rational people. These people are cultists, they're fanatics, and they think in rhetoric. They don't think in logical conclusions, logical reasoning. And they, remember what Matt Slick does. Every time he talks about logic and reason, what he really means is his emotions. And he says, oh, Open theists, they, they re reject uh, logic, and then he'll talk about something that, if this was true, then this bad thing would be true, which I don't like. It's like, dude, you're, you're an emotional mess. You're an emotional mess. You're not, you're not talking about logic. You're not talking about reason. You're talking about your emotions. And way different things. You're not talking about uh, dialect. This is uh, in this book, this Fox Day book that I got pulled up. The author writes about the differences between rhetoric and dialect. Let's read one of those quotes right off the bat here, and uh, we can see how well that applies to the Calvinists. This quote comes from the end of the book, 
Again, you must keep in mind that the actual information content is irrelevant. SJWs, substitute Calvinists, communicate in competitive emotion. If you're not doing the same, then you're not communicating with them. You're doing little more than serving as a punching bag for their verbal strikes. I realize this is probably doesn't make sense, but that is because you are a normal, sane individual who thinks rather than feels. But keep in mind that just as their argument X is not X because feel bad makes no sense to you. Your argument that X cannot be not X due to the law of non-contradiction makes no sense to SJW. You know, it's, it sometimes makes sense to a Calvinist, the law of non-contradiction, but they'll, they'll introduce things to, to try to uh, overcome their contradictions. They'll call something, oh, that's an antinomy. That uh, it makes no sense. We can't understand it. It just is. You know, they introduce these things that... Uh, Oh, there could be free will and divine predestination at the same time. Somehow, we just don't know how it works, but it is true because that's what the Bible says. No, you're misreading the Bible. You're misreading the Bible. You're, you're, you're objecting, you're throwing out common sense readings of your proof text that you just don't want to consider because you prefer your Calvinism over reading comprehension. So in the spirit of Vox Day, in the spirit of what I've noticed about Calvinistic tendencies to act and think and behave like social justice warriors, here are 15 rules for Calvinists. Number one, Calvinists always lie. Matt Slick, during his Will Duffy debate, claimed not to know Jeremiah 18 because, because he wanted to avoid it. He didn't want to talk about that passage, but we know it's a lie. We know he's a liar. He was lying through his teeth because just days before, he actually references Jeremiah 18 in setting up for this very debate, the debate in which he claimed not to understand or know the context of Jeremiah 18. And in addition to that, I had asked him previously on in, during the Morell slick debate on free will, I had asked him about Jeremiah 18, and he answered that question then. It was only when he was uh, being controlled by Will Duffney's line of reasoning, a line of questioning that he couldn't escape from, he didn't want to deal with Jeremiah 18. He claimed not to be familiar with it. Oh, in, Genesis, in Jeremiah 18, 8, God says that uh, the nation that repents, he will then relent of his calamity, which he said he's going to do to them. That's exactly what we would say. I'm going to do this to you. And then they repent. Then he doesn't do it. Well, wait a minute. He said he's going to do it. Yeah. And by saying it, it brings them to the place of repentance, which is exactly what God decreed. This is how it works. This is how we have answers for stuff like this. Not what does it mean when the Bible says that God will no longer do that which he thought he would do? I Jeremiah see, 18. I have to look at the... Uh, it's, it's literally one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. <laughs> I, I'm, I in, don't know the context. I can't really comment. Okay, in Jeremiah 18, 18, I'll explain it to you. In Jeremiah 18, God is talking about... If he says he's going to destroy a nation and that nation repents, he will no longer do that which he thought he would do. What does it mean, that which he thought he would do? I don't know if that's the correct translation. I don't know the verse is. Like I said, I if, can't... If it's the correct translation, I can't what does it mean? Okay, I can't comment on something I've not studied in depth, okay? okay. I, I've been not able to answer that one. Okay. Because I'm not able to answer that one. He's a liar. He's a liar. We also find liars in uh, Dr. Zachary Riotes, uh, Dr. Zoidberg, as we lovingly call him, and his uh, Calvinist friend, who lied through their teeth to Dr. Leighton Flowers to get him to come do this debate. They claim they wouldn't have this uh, rhetorical, emotional, yeah, you know, calling everyone else heretics a moment. Uh, they lied. Said he didn't like the way those other guys that I debated all the rhetoric, and he wanted to have a cordial and congenial, that's the exact quote, cordial and congenial debate. Well, um, I, I was baited and switched. I mean, it's that pure yeah. and simple. It's very obvious that uh, he knew, and I told him, I don't have any interest in debating anybody that, you know, that calls me a heretic or thinks that I don't, uh, you know, preach the real gospel. I even went over, I don't want to debate somebody that's going to spend time calling me a Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. Um, and well, I gave him plenty of opportunity in our first discussion to tell me where he stood as far as his theological worldview. And uh, instead yeah. of telling me the truth, he told me he affirms the London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is a more moderate, I guess, than his view, obviously. But yet, obviously, in the debate, he, he denied, uh, or at least he didn't stand up to his own partner, denying that the London Baptist and faith, message and faith was the, the, the confession that he sent to us and that he said he affirmed pre-debate. Um, and so he baited and switched. 
Um, and he yeah. did, so, I, I think, intentionally because he knew I would not agree to a debate against somebody who who uh, held to that extreme of a view. They, they tried, lied to get him to come to this debate, and then they did it anyways. These people are dishonest, fundamentally. You don't trust what they say. I don't trust what they say. They claim something, probably a lie. Number two, Calvinists always double down. And they'll, you know, Matt Slick, he claimed again and again not to know Jeremiah 18. We have it later brought up in, in the, the question and answers by an irate individual calling him out, being, being peeved at his lies, his constant lying. Matt Slick's lying because he's a liar. Number three, Calvinists always project. And I got pulled up here this uh, psychological projection so that everyone could understand what projecting is. Projection, psychological projection, is a theory in psychology in which humans defend themselves against their own unconscious impulses or qualities, both positive and negative, by denying their existence in themselves while attributing them to others. For example, a person who is habitually intolerant may constantly accuse other people of being intolerant. That's social justice warriorism to a T. These people are incredible racists. All they care about is someone's gender or someone's skin color. They're racist, racist. Where you and I, we live our daily lives and try not to think about people's skin color. We don't treat people differently based on race or gender. That's all these SJWs think about. They're incredibly racist, bigoted people. Calvinists. Calvinists do the same thing. They project all the time. So they start claiming that other people aren't reading the Bible, even when you want to specifically just focus on the Bible, they'll claim that you're avoiding the Bible, that you're coming up with new interpretations that aren't contextually supported. They'll claim that they're the ones who care about the Bible. They'll claim that you're the heretic, you're the heretic, not them with their Gnosticism, where there's a special enlightened elect who gets salvation. No, not, the, not their Gnosticism. That's not the heresy. Not, not the heresy, their hypostatic union heresy in which the, the physical person of Jesus is not divine because that would uh, constitute change in the Godhead. No, not that heresy. The heresy specifically mentioned in the Bible that they believe. No, no, not, not them. You're the heretic, of course. And they, they think that's an argument, too. They think that uh, just calling you a heretic, that's the end of the argument, and you don't have to debate anymore. You don't have to consider someone's point because, uh, oh, no, they're a heretic, so you just ignore them and move on and just ignore their point. That's their mindset, these people. And yeah, social justice warriors are the same. Oh, you're a Nazi, you know, and Nazi is anyone they disagree with. You're a Nazi, so I don't have to refute your actual point. Number four, Calvinists always try to prove Calvinism using Calvinism. And this is one I add to the list by suggestion of uh, Kenny on the Facebook group, God is Open. And I uh, replaced my other number four where, you know, SJWs always eat their own. That was added by diversity in comics to the SJW list. And it works with Calvinism as well. Uh, James White uh, is attacked on and off and he attacks others on and off. They kind of eat their own like that. But uh, it's better to replace that with something more of, you know, who they are. And so number this new number four, I think, works pretty well. Calvinists always try to prove Calvinism using Calvinism. They think that if they just describe Calvinism to you, that's the same thing as uh, arguing for the veracity of what Calvinism is. Number five, Calvinists always claim to be misrepresented. And I have pulled up this article by Leighton Flowers, and Leighton Flowers spends his time refuting Calvinism, all sorts of uh, issues surrounding Calvinism. He's a famous Calvinist debater. And of course, he's a former Calvinist. And often these Calvinists, when you're dealing with them, they're debating with them, they just say, you don't understand Calvinism. If you don't agree with them, you just don't understand them. If you agreed with them, then you'd understand it. It's this uh, circular reasoning that they always employ. They always claim to be mis misrepresented. Even when you're quoting Calvinists directly, they claim to be misrepresented. It, it's, it's this really, really crazy psychology that they have, this cognitive dissonance in them, where someone can't disagree with what they think. They just have to just misunderstand everything. And no, that's not true. Uh, a lot of times people debating Calvinism know Calvinism better than the Calvinists. And a lot of Calvinists, I just had put a poll on a Calvinist website about do you uh, accept divine simplicity? And over half of them had never heard of it. You haven't heard of your own basis for your theology. This is the, the groundwork for God's immutability, God's simplicity, God's eternity. And you've never even heard of it. Never even heard of it. 
so in reality, in reality where real people live, Calvinists, they don't understand their own theology. And yeah, a lot of people understand Calvinism when they're debating Calvinists. And the Calvinists, their claims to be misrepresented is just them just trying to deflect the argument. They're just trying to shut down debate. They're not trying to attack issues. They're just going to claim to be misrepresented. And especially if you point out the logical conclusions of their theology, they'll just claim to be misrepresented. No, pointing out the logical conclusions of what you just said is not misrepresenting you. It's not. So to talk to us, break that down. Tell us why those logical conclusions of what you just said are not the logical conclusions of what you just said, rather than just claiming to be misrepresented. Focus on the arguments. Don't focus on uh, deflecting and shutting down conversation. Number six, Calvinists always obfuscate. And for those who don't know what the word obfuscate means, in uh, Vampire Masquerade Bloodlines, it's this video game, one of the effects that you could have your vampire do was obfuscation, and they became invisible. Obfuscate means to cloud, to, uh, to make less visible, to, to muddy the waters. Obfuscate. And look at the Matt Slick uh, cross-examination in the Will Duffy debate. Do you agree with me that according to your theology, God is no longer free? That he's no longer free, which means that he's no longer able to do whatever he wants? No. Is God free to think a new thought? He doesn't have to think a new thought. That's not an answer. That's not an issue question. of freedom. Is God free to think a new that's thought? Not, that's a wrong application of freedom. See, this is where you guys, so no offense, you make mistakes. Okay, hold on. This is a simple yes or no question. Let me try this. Is I don't God, know his answer everything yes or is, no. Is God free to write a new song that has never been written? If you want yes or no, I can't answer. Okay, why? Why can't I answer? We're talking about God, the most powerful being in the universe, and you don't know if he's free to write a new song? In the sense that you're describing freedom, we have to define our terms. And you said it's just the ability to make choices, right? The ability to decide. To decide. So could he then, I could ask the question, could he decide ahead of time to have written all the songs right away from forever ago? Yes. He certainly could have done that. So and your on question for a would contradict that. Hold on for a second. So you're, by, by saying could he have written all the songs, you're saying that his creativity is limited? His creativity is not limited, it's infinite, which is why he would know exactly what he's doing from eternity. Is that your position, or are you just throwing that out there to try My to get position. out of this question? My position? No, no. Do you no. actually think God wrote every song no, I don't that's, think he that's wrote possible? Any. No? <laughs> okay. No, I don't think he wrote okay. anything. Is God free to design a new butterfly? In what sense free? In a, in a sense of a, of a butterfly he's never designed, can See, he design a new butterfly? We're yes coming no? back to the same issue of what it means to be free to accomplish something. There's different senses in which the issue of freedom can apply. So sure. I explained it once. I'm guessing, though, back over I'm, I'm guessing, though, that my nine-year-old daughter comprehends this question. I'm trying to help everybody understand. Well, that's nice. Either God has the ability to design a new butterfly or he doesn't. Okay. So in what sense are you saying, asking the question? I'm asking it in the sense of a butterfly that he's never designed in his mind. Can he design a new butterfly? How could there be anything in his mind he doesn't know of? Are you saying he's designed all possible butterflies? I believe he knows all things. So there is nothing in God's mind that he's not aware of. So there's nothing new that could come into existence. Okay. Can God decree something new? Do you admit, let me pause, do you admit that God did not decree everything that's possible? Let's define decree. Just look at how this argument goes. Look how this conversation goes. He tries to be less clear instead of more clear. He muddies the waters. He doesn't want to answer questions, and he doesn't want to deal with his beliefs. He wants to waste time. He's a time waster. He obfuscates. Number seven, Calvinists always use words in idiosyncratic ways. Idiosyncratic, if you're unfamiliar with the term, means related to the self. So if you have a private interpretation that no one else shares, that's uh, idiosyncratic uh, reading or idiosyncratic understanding. It's related to self. It's not shared. And this quote by Roger Olson I refer to all the time when, uh, you know, I, I have to go back and reference it again and again because it's just so well put together. It's about sovereignty. It reads this. There is no sovereignty in human experience like the sovereignty Calvinists insist we must attribute to God in order really to believe in God's sovereignty. In ordinary human language, sovereignty never means total control of every thought and every intention of every subject, and yet it has become a Calvinist mantra that non-Calvinists do not believe in God's sovereignty. I have a tape of a talk where 
R.C. Sproul says that Arminians say they believe in God's sovereignty, but he goes on to say there's precious little sovereignty left after Arminians qualify it. And yet he doesn't admit there or anywhere that I'm aware of that his own view of God's sovereignty, which I call divine determinism, is not at all like sovereignty as we ordinarily mean it. It's like saying an absolute monarch who doesn't control every subject's every thought and intention and every molecule in the universe that he doesn't really exercise sovereignty. It's an idiosyncratic notion of sovereignty. So look at that. Look at that quote. It's a good quote. It talks about how Calvinists take words, they reject the normal understanding of those words, they hijack language, they're word thinkers, they're social justice warriors, these Calvinists, and they attribute absurd meanings to normal words and then insist that uh, their theology is true because they've hi now hijacked this language. And they, they do this throughout the Bible as well. When the Bible says something, I am the Alpha and the Mo Omega, they'll say, of, of course, this most definitely refers to God being outside of time. No, you're just hijacking language. Prove it from the context. Look in the context and tell me what in the context is just that reading. Why you think it's a metaphysical statement about space and time. We, we have an article on uh, the Calvinist Dictionary, just a list of words that they hijacked and redefine in order to make their theology sound better. They're word thinkers. It's part of their, their cultist mentality. They think in, in uh, platitudes. Number eight, Calvinists always substitute ad hominem for real arguments. They think that just by calling someone a heretic that they don't actually have to answer objections. We've already talked about this a little bit. But look at the Matt Slick debate where he consistently refers to Will Duffy as a Mormon. He throws it out there and throws it out there and throws it out there. Once again, this concept of God in open theism reminds me of the concept of God of Mormonism, who's increasing in knowledge and growing in perfection. He thinks that arguing an ad hominem is a substitute for real debate. And it's not. And a lot of Calvinists, when I'm debating them, they do this too. They say, oh, you're just a Pelagian or a semi-Pelagian or you're just a, like a Mormon or whatever else. Or you're a heretic. These people, they, they think ad hominem is, is proper and an intellectual substitute for actual debate. It's not. These people are irrational people. No, that's a fallacy. Ad hominem is a fallacy, rejecting someone's views based on who they are rather than the merit of the argument is a fallacy of logic. They're irrational people. Number nine, Calvinists always avoid answering questions. Really? Do, do we have to have to illustrate this? You know, never once do I ever get into debate with the Calvinists where they readily answer questions. It's uh, how many times have I asked the Calvinists, was the human part of Jesus divine? I've only ever once had one answer to it. Only one time in my history of answering that. I've, I've asked it since the, the Enyart, uh James White debate. I've been asking that question. I've only had one answer. And that was on the God is Open page in which one of the rules states that you have to answer. And it was by a Calvinist that I have a personal connection with. And so he, he's a little bit more intellectually honest than your normal Calvinist. But they don't answer questions. They don't answer questions. That's why they don't fare very well on our website where you're forced to answer questions or else you're out of there. They don't answer questions. Oh, they're so dishonest. Just look look at that cross-examination between Slick and Will Duffy. He does not want to answer anything. He's not answering questions. How many, how many conversations do I have pulled down, recorded, and copied in which I try to get one, they, they, I'll answer two, three, four, five of their questions. They will refuse to answer a single one of my questions. A single one. So was my most recent one. My most recent one was uh, I was debating Proverbs, uh, Eyes of the Lord. The Calvinist said, oh, look, it says the eyes of the Lord are on the ways of the good and the wicked all time. And I just I tried, I, I was answering question after question. He was dealing with Genesis 18. I was answering questions about that. And I said, how many eyes of the Lord does God have? How many? And then I posted a verse in uh, Zechariah, uh, which specifically says God has seven eyes, because these eyes are actually a reference to these angels. And these angels have a specific function in the Bible, are to watch the ways of uh, human beings. And uh, the adversary in Job is one of these eyes. And his job is to go around the world testing the good and testing the evil and uh, seeing how people act. They're, they're the eyes of the Lord. And, and this is, this is a, a common notion. Like if, if you have a king and the eyes of the king are in this bar, 
you think, okay, that means the king has spies in this bar. That's what this is referring to. It's not referring to this idea of omniscience. And he, he wouldn't even answer the question, how many eyes of the Lord does God have? When the verse specifically said seven, there are seven eyes of the Lord. He wouldn't answer. He would not answer that one question. It's, it's so simple. Why, did, why don't you want to answer the question? Because it undoes your forced, your forced, absurd reading of that verse. And it allows other possibilities. And then this guy goes into this thing where, where he, he claims that uh, infinite understanding, uh, that there's only one way to interpret those two words together or in conjunction. And it's, of course, it's this uh, platonic notion of uh, divine uh, necessity, knowing everything, something like that. He, he, he refused, refused to even admit the possibility of being a different way of taking that phrase. This is who we're dealing with. It. This is who we are dealing with. Number 10, Calvinists always judge arguments by how it makes them feel. Well, we see this in podcast after podcast of responding to Calvinist arguments. And they always say stuff like, oh, you know, if hope and theism was true, we couldn't be assured of our salvation. Oh, 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 oh no, what, what will we do? And uh, we even have, uh, who was it, A.W. Pink on that? You're talking about, uh, you know, this assured salvation that they really, really and truly in their hearts need to believe in. And so it's always uh, this argument that this emotional argument. And we see that over and over in this list, these uh, emotional arguments, uh, idiosyncratic ways of interpreting, these uh, ad hominem attacks, uh, obfuscation, uh, misrepresentation to shut down conversation. It's this emotional way of acting, behaving, and thinking. Calvinists tend to be a very emotional people. You know, you're going to find the one-off rational Calvinists who can have a rational conversation. But by and large, these people think in emotions. They think in rhetoric. They don't think in logical, rational reasoning. Number 11, Calvinists always deny the implications of their beliefs. Will Duffy just got kicked out of this uh, Calvinist answer all questions group because he, he said, basically, because they believe that only what's determined can happen uh, that they believe God couldn't have created differently than he did create. That's the implication of their belief. Divine determinism necessitates that God can't do other things that he didn't always determine to do. By necessity, that is the implication of their belief. He was kicked out of the group for insisting on this. This, this is how they think. This is how they act. And they ban him for talking like this, for pointing out this uh, obvious obvious conclusions of their belief. They don't want to deal with the actual ramifications of what their belief says. And then, then they'll think, then they'll reject other people's views based on quote unquote ramifications. This shows their, their dualistic way of thinking, their, their special pleading. Special pleading is another term to be familiar with. It's in which the things that are favorable to your side, you take in one way, and the things that aren't favorable to your side, you take in it with a completely different standard. It's having double standards. And this is a common Calvinist thing to do. Number 12, Calvinists always refuse to understand the position they're refuting. You see this, uh, my dealings with Matt Slick especially, where he didn't want to even consider what I was saying. And he wanted to take this idiosyncratic uh, notion, this idiosyncratic uh, way of understanding, what is it? We're talking about Colossians 2 and the debt being paid. And my dad was sitting right there and he threw out, okay, the, the American soldiers during World War II uh, paid for our freedom, right? Our freedom in the future. But Matt's like, he wanted the, the Christ paying our debts to be some sort of legal obligation that was known ahead of time. And it had to be a precise number and uh, so all the sins needed to be eternally foreknown so this de debt can be paid off exactly. And he went except me talking about what if Bill Gates, what if he just set up this fund and he just paid off everyone who wanted to opt in, he paid off their home loans. Yeah, you could say that Bill Gates paid their debts. You could do it. And he doesn't have to know in advance whose debts he's paying. It, it's, it's, it's not necessitated by the text there. And Matt Slick he didn't even want to even consider that. He didn't even want to understand what I was saying because, of course, in his mind, he needed to get to a specific point. And this was just like the base of his argument. And you're undoing his base. He can't, he can't even consider. He doesn't even want to think about how other people take text, how other people read text. He doesn't want to consider views that are not his own.
Number 13, Calvinists always dismiss common sense readings of verses. And uh, how often do you see this? You're in a debate discussion with a Calvinist, and they'll just refuse to even admit that your reading is uh, one possibility. We, we find this, especially in the debate I already mentioned, in which someone says that his understanding is infinite as a reference to these platonic attributes, rather than just being capable of doing stuff. Uh, maybe a hyperbole, a generalization, a common thing we find in the Bible when it's talking about uh, infinite things, like the, the amount of grain that Joseph collects is infinite without number. And they want to just take it and force it to mean their specific things that uh, they, they take the verse and they claim it means what we want it to mean and no one else has any claim on this. And for some reason, this John 10, 26 came to mind when we're talking about this, in which it says, but you do not believe for you're not among my sheep. And they'll say, see, uh, the, the sheep is a set group and the people don't believe because they're not part of that. But, you know, just the normal way that that word is used in other contexts. But let's read this here. Mark 1, 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. For they were fishermen. So it's not like uh, anyone who's not a fisherman can't cast their nets. It's saying because they're fishermen, this is why they're doing that. And uh, in the previous verse, it's, it's you're saying, you guys aren't followers of me. That's why you're not doing this. It's nothing about predestination, determinism, having a select group of a special enlightened individuals who are, who are uh, spiritually imbued by God. It's nothing like that. Common, common readings uh, allow different alternatives, and they'll just reject that out of hand. They'll reject common sense readings of their proof text because they are really, really insistent that their proof texts are their proof texts. It's because they're desperate. They don't have very many proof texts, and so they have to grab on, grasp for whatever they could get. Number 14 goes hand in hand with number 13. Number 13 is about the common sense reading. If you go to the common person and you get 10 people to read the same passage and give you 10 different readings of it, you know, those will probably be the range of acceptable in interpretations of that uh, verse, that statement, that phrase. Number 14 is the scholarly discussions. Calvinists always dismiss scholarly readings of the Bible. And my most recent example with this is when some guy got mad at me for quoting Rabbi Sachs on Exodus uh, 3.14. The guy turns out to be a racist. Uh, surprise, surprise. A Calvinist is a racist. The social justice warriors and Calvinists emerge. He hates the Jews. And he said, oh, you are holding hands with the killers of Jesus. They're like, you are an incredible racist person. And, you know, that's that's good for me to do is shut down the debate because I didn't actually want to talk to this guy. And he just talked his nonsense over and over. I tried to talk to him about the context of Exodus 3.14, about how God changes within that passage. God gets frustrated. God, uh, he has to change his plans based on Moses' actions. They build cascading contingency plans in the context. And the context of that quote, God's name, is about his relationship to Israel, his relationship to the patriarchs. It's not about, uh, you know, this platonic notion of being eternal outside of time that he was trying to push. And so me quoting Rabbi Sachs set him off. He didn't want to take in account scholarly understandings of that verse, and he just wanted to dismiss it out of hand. I refer back to, uh, you know, uh, our number of 13 again. Calvinists always dismiss common sense readings of the Bible. So the common sense reading of I am who I am, he dismissed. Then he also dismissed the scholarly reading of that as well. And, you know, what they do, these Calvinists, they build themselves this world where only Calvinists can read the Bible. And then they'll turn to phrases in the Bible like the spiritual understand, but the flesh doesn't understand. And they'll claim that the Calvinists have the spiritual enlightenment and only they can understand the text. Not the common sense readings of the text, not the scholarly readings but there's special interpretation that only they themselves have. It's, it's this very insulated cult-like mentality. And you see this over and over, over and over, them, them simultaneously attacking the common man reading and the scholarly reading. It's a funny phenomenon. It's a total cognitive dissonance, and it, it does signal their cult, their cult mentality. Last but not least, number 15, Calvinists always will make unproven absolute claims. Let's hear Matt Slick do that. All the, we're picking on Matt Slick a lot, but he's fresh in our minds. He there's a fresh debate, but you see this all the time. They just make all sorts of absolute claims with zero evidence, uh, nothing, nothing to back up what they're saying, and they just make the claim. 
It's like sh- show something, sh- prove anything, have some sort of basis for your claim. Just just saying it doesn't make it true. If something is perfect, it cannot become more perfect. Otherwise, it's not perfect to begin with. A perfect square cannot become more perfect by being more square. Logically, if God is already perfect, he doesn't become more perfect by learning something. Unless, as open theism implies, God is less than perfect now. You can't just say something and it's magically true. That reality doesn't work like that. Reality doesn't flex to whatever you think is best, Matt Slick. Your mind can't control the world, can't make a new reality uh, different than what the actual reality is. And so prove, prove your arguments. Don't just make absurd claims and just pretend they're factual. All right, so this, this podcast has gone probably pretty long. There's a lot of extra media content, and there, there's, there's ways that I could increase and, uh, and add evidence to each of these claims. I've, I've, again, I've had hundreds upon hundreds of debates with Calvinists throughout my life. I understand their mentality. I understand how they work. I understand that I am getting a selective subset of Calvinists who will reach out and actually debate with individuals, not the quiet Calvinists. I understand that. And I also understand that uh, a lot of these claims are absolute and there are exceptions. But uh, let's refer back to Vox Day and what he says about this claim that we can't talk like this because it's too absolute. In talking about the difference between rhetoric and dialect, Vox Day says, for example, consider the title of this book. It is not strictly true in the dialectical sense to assert that SJWs never tell the truth. But to be dialectically sound, one should say SJWs frequently lie, or better yet, SJWs have often been observed to lie in situations when doing will serve their immediate interests. But as Aristotle tells us, the best rhetoric is rooted in truth, and the statement SJWs always lie rings emotionally true because SJWs lie so often and so reliably that it resonates with every individual who has been witness to their habitual dishonesty. That's why SJWs always lie is flawed dialect, but accurate and effective rhetoric. So let's let's uh, scroll up to one more quote of his uh, to really hammer home this point of why this list is created, why this list is phrased how it is. And uh, it's, it's against this rhetoric this the rhetorical thinking of the Calvinists, their, their refusal to think, to be rational, to debate in a respectable ways, and instead to lash out with emotional reasoning and logic. And, and let's read this. Let me give you a practical example of how this works. If I say SJWs occasionally lie in response to an SJW false statement, this is proper dialect but poor rhetoric as it is likely to fail to persuade a rhetoric speaker of actual truth, namely that the SJW is lying in the present circumstance. The better rhetorical statement is SJWs always lie, which is not dialectically sound, or if you prefer, untrue, but despite its lack of soundness, it is more likely to persuade the rhetoric speaker to believe the relevant truth, which is that SJW is lying. Hence, the importance of knowing your audience and understanding which language of discourse they speak. When you speak in rhetoric to a dialect speaker, you will tend to sound very dishonest, even when you are utilizing effective rhetoric that is perfectly in line with the truth. On the other hand, you can't speak dialectic to a rhetoric speaker for the obvious reason that he cannot be informed or persuaded by it. He simply does not have the capacity. I strongly prefer communicating in dialectic myself, but that is the language reserved for those who are intellectually honest and capable of changing their minds on the basis of information. And we know that Calvinists are not those people who are intellectually honest, as we have seen in this list and in my experience. So I speak dialect to those capable of communicating on that level, and I speak rhetoric to those who are not. Recall that rhetoric to which SJWs are uniformly limited, is based not on logic or reason, but emotion. However, because many SJWs attempt to cloak their rhetoric in pseudo-dialect, you can use sound dialect to strip them of that pseudo-dialect cloak on behalf of those capable of following the real thing, while communicating directly in rhetoric to the SJWs. This requires a degree of fluency in both discourse languages as well as the ability to switch back and forth between them at will, a skill that takes some time to develop. All you have to do is scroll through my YouTube comments and the Calvinists, when they come to this channel, the God is Open channel on YouTube, and they leave comments, it's always this uh, attack on my character or this it's as a vague statement that, oh, you don't know what you're talking about or you're lying or something like that. 
you got to bring it back to them on their level. They're rhetoric speakers. They don't have an actual point. The people who have points, they, they will put their actual points in their comment. And so you know who you're dealing with right away when they're speaking the language of emotion. And so what I say to them is I say, what you're saying doesn't sound like Christianity. That's not in the Bible. That's actually opposed to the Bible. And here's where it's opposed to the Bible. You're speaking the language of Platonism you would be more comfortable as a Platonist. I make a lot more headway with dealing with Calvinists, talking to them and refocusing them on the fact that they are not talking the Bible, they're talking Platonism, they're talking paganism, because that hits them at their emotional core and they think with their emotions. And so I, I found that's a better strategy for dealing with these rhetoric speaking Calvinists than actual honest conversation about the issues. They're dealing with platitudes. They're dealing with emotional sounding language. They're dealing with rhetoric. You got to deal with them on their level. They're not capable of being rational, well-thinking, well-intentioned individual. They're dishonest ind individuals. They're SJWs of the world. Well, I hope you like this podcast. Uh, if you don't, leave me an angry comment saying, oh, you can't say always. And I'll say, well, I just told you, I just told you why I do it. And it works, and it's, I think it's a good thing to do. I think it's a good way to handle these Calvinists in the future. You can't be treating these grown adults with kids' gloves. you got to treat them in a, a fashion that, they, that reflects on who they are and it reflects on how they think. And that's how you got to deal with these people. If you have any questions or comments on this podcast, send that to godisopenquestions at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.